You're listening to Rutgers Radio on 88.7 WRSU-FM New Brunswick and online at WRSU.org. Fighting soldiers from the sky Fearless men who jump and die Men who mean just what they say The brave men of the Green Beret Silver wings upon their chest These are men, America's best One hundred men will test today but only three when the green beret trained to live off nature's land trained in combat hand to hand men who fight by night and day courage take from the green beret silver wings on their chest These are men America's best One hundred men Will test today But only three Win the Green Beret Back at home A young wife waits Her Green Beret Has met his fate he has died for those oppressed, leaving her this last request. Put silver wings on my son's chest. Make him one of America's best. He'll be a man they'll test one day. Have him win. Veterans Corner. Okay, 30 seconds to count down. Good luck. Watch him be like, now can you do that all over again? How do I sound now? Not good? Mm. This is a milestone event. We are excited to be here. Okay, we do a countdown. Three, two, one, and we're on. That you can count the stars on that flag. You can thank a teacher. That you have that flag as the flag of your country. You can thank a veteran. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Veterans Corner. My name is Don Busney, and we are brought to you courtesy of WRHFM New Brunswick. And before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler, who sang the Battle of the Green Berets, which is the lead into today's program. Our guest today is Fran Rachopi, who is a former U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beret and currently a Merrill Lynch financial advisor. And also on the phone with us today is Jen Wilson. Jen is the CEO of the Invictus Corps and also of Army Week. Fran and Jen, welcome. Hi, thanks, thanks for having Don. us, Don. Oh, it's good to have you here. So, Fran, let me go through some of your uh, bio points. Uh, you grew up on the shores of Massachusetts and Rhode Island in a family of avid sailors, racing sailboats of all classes and sizes. You graduated in 1999 from Weston High School outside of Boston, where you were a varsity starter on both the football and the cross teams. As a freshman at BU, you walked on to the men's rowing team, spending all four years on the team and earning yourself an athletic scholarship. Fran, tell us more about that. I mean, you just walked up there, and they gave you a try-on, and then you got a scholarship, and you were there for four years. I did. When I left uh, Weston High and went to Boston University, um, the football team had recently been uh, disbanded, and there was no lacrosse team. I kind of sat there as I was getting ready to go that summer before, and I said, what am I going to do with myself to keep myself out of trouble? Someone said, well, there's the rowing team. You're tall. You could do that. And I was terrible at basketball, so that certainly wasn't going to happen. Uh, so I went. I met the coach, and uh, we had a couple of good conversations. And he said, well, you know, if you want to try out, go ahead and do so. Because um, about 50%, you know, if not more, of some of the rowing teams uh, out there are actually made up of walk-ons, uh, you know, people like me who came on in their freshman year. So I went, um, 
did, uh, I guess I did fairly decently and made the, the first freshman vote. And um, then uh, my sophomore year, you know, continued on and got a little bit of money in a scholarship and then got a little more my junior year and a little bit more than that my senior year. And uh, you know, after four years, that was it. Well, that's, that's great. So you graduated from BU with honors in 2003 with a BA in journalism and a minor in political science. Now, before we get into your Army career, let me just go back, back to Jen Wilson. Jen, you are the CEO of the Invictus Corps and Army Week. Why don't you talk to us for a minute about Army Week, and then we'll talk about Invictus Corps. Yeah, so um, uh, my business partner and I created Army Week um, back in 2013. Which, by the way, I'm just going to interrupt you. Excuse me, but, you know, I, I, I was so thrilled when you sent that email that uh, your partner is coming back. That is wonderful. Yeah, he's currently in Iraq and Kuwait. He's been there for a year. He's been on a year deployment for uh, support of Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, and he'll be back stateside at the end of January, beginning of February. So we're very happy to have him back, obviously, and safe and sound. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we started it in 2013 because we started – we noticed that we had a lot of friends that were coming home uh, from service that had a lot of needs that weren't being met by either the VA or the DOD. And then we had a lot of friends that were starting – that were seeing the same things we were and starting nonprofits to try to deal with it um, on the private sector at the community level. And we created Army Week to try to bridge that gap, to be the umbrella organization, to – pair up veterans in need with organizations at the community level that could help them um, so that they didn't have to rely on big, cumbersome, bureaucratic organizations. We did that in 2013, and um, we have a week's worth of events every June. Our anchor event is the uh, Army Birthday Gala that we have in New York um, every year. This year it'll be on uh, on the Army's birthday on June 14th. Every year we have a Soldier for Life that we honor that has served. We typically do the Vietnam War uh, for all sorts of reasons that I'm sure are obvious. And we, they have to have come home and had uh, an effect, positive effect on their community, a philanthropic business, giving back to their community. Um, and so this year we're honoring Jan Scruggs, who oh, right, uh, was a yeah. Vietnam, yeah, he was a Vietnam uh, veteran. And then he also, with $2,500 in his pocket, founded the Vietnam Memorial on the National Mall and got it built. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So, Jan, before we get back to uh, Fran, just tell us a little bit about Invictus Corps. The Invictus Corps is a, is a consulting firm that I started with a colleague of mine. One is in the Army. Uh, one is not in uh, one is private sector, but uh, her dad is a Marine. And we will uh, take on a clients and organizations that need assistance. For me personally, I handle military and production. Uh, I have 14 years in TV production um, experience, and I have specific experience for military production, athletes specifically, adaptive athletes. Uh, I actually just started a new role uh, with Our Vet Success. I will be the head of production for uh, two shows, uh, Racing Heroes, that will tape in May and air in November, and then the Triumph Games, which I've been on the team since the very beginning uh, with uh, Under Secretary of the Army Patrick Murphy. Uh, we will tape that in uh, July, and it will air in August or September. Boy, those are exciting things. They really are. And, Jen, I'm going to get back to you. And as we go through uh, the interview with Fran, please feel free to jump in and join the conversation. But, Fran, getting back to you now, since you had such a nautical background, what prompted you to join the Army? Why not the Navy? Well, you know, I was a journalism major uh, at Boston University, and 9-11 happened in my the beginning of my junior year. And I'm not a 9-11 guy in the sense that when that happened, I kind of looked around and I said, I'm going to go answer the call. My initial uh, idea was that I'm going to go report on this, and I'm going to be a journalist, and I'm going to be a war correspondent. And through the course of my junior and senior year, uh, as the war in Afghanistan kicked off and then we went into Iraq, the bulk of our studies and the core curriculum of journalism was really real time, covering exactly what was going on uh, you know, at that time. And as more time went on and got closer to graduation, you know, I was watching what special forces were doing and what the Green Berets were doing in Afghanistan and how they had been so effective in the early days in Iraq. And I said, you know what? Why would I report on this when I can go and I can do this? And I said, if I want to go into journalism you know, or, or political science, you know, sometime later on in my life, I can do it. But the 
time is now to go out there and be a part of, of making history. And you did. How many years did you serve in the Army? I, I did about 12 and a half years. All right. And But in, back in the fall of 2003, when you entered the Army, you were an infantry officer, and you graduated from the U.S. Army Ranger School, the Airborne School, and then you went on to the Reconnaissance and Surveillance Leaders Course. I'd like to talk about all three of those, but let's start with Ranger School. Fran, what is Ranger School designed to do? It is designed to test your mental and physical stamina and how you as a leader can perform under the most intense mental and physical stress. And by putting you in these situations where you're sleep-deprived, you're food-deprived, you have to plan, you have to execute with precision in everything that you do. And it teaches you how to combat those mental and physical feelings that may make a person not want to do anything, push through that, and effectively accomplish a mission. And it's a 60-day combat leadership course, and it's oriented towards small unit tactics, but it's also been called the most physically and mentally demanding leadership school the Army has to offer. It's open to soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines in the U.S. Armed Forces, as well as allied military students. But historically, Ranger School, the graduation rate has been around 50%, and it fluctuates. I looked at those numbers. It's really like between 40 and – but that's uh, – I mean, that's quite an attrition rate, and that speaks to just how tough and rugged that program is. It is, and I think that, you know, I'm trying to think back to, to my class, but, you know, I would say that, you know, we started with somewhere around you know, probably 300, 350 on day one for the initial uh, you know, PT test, and I think we probably had uh, uh, about 60 from the original class uh, who graduated you know, about two months later. And I remember you know, standing there in that formation at graduation looking around, and you know, there were definitely some people who weren't there that uh, you know, were fighting hard and had been recycled and were getting some, you know, I guess we'll call it additional training um, while they worked towards their ranger tab. But when I looked around and you know, I looked at everybody there, I knew that everybody there deserved the opportunity to wear the ranger tab and graduate that day. Yeah, that must have been a wonderful feeling. But, Fran, when you started Ranger School, I mean, it's a very daunting program. I mean, you could not have been 100% sure that you were going to finish it. I mean, that's just basic human nature. But at what point in the program did you convince yourself, yes, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get that Ranger cap? Well, I'll tell you what. The, the Army does a great job when you're an infantry officer, and they tell you that you don't have a choice. And when you go... Uh, to the, the infantry officer basic course. And you spend four months in, in that course learning how to be a, an infantry platoon leader. That really is a mental and physical preparation to go to ranger school. Mm -hmm. And at the completion of the infantry officer basic course, uh, you kind of are almost presented with two choices. One, go to ranger school, or two, leave the infantry. So, you know, I remember at the time when my friends and I were, were finishing up and getting ready to go to Ranger School, the only thing that everybody wanted was for us to go and get out of there because that was all we ever talked about. And they said, you know what, we don't even care that you're going to be gone for the next 60 days. Just get out of here so that we don't have to hear you talking about it anymore. Wow. All right. And you, that's what you went on to do. Well, let's take a, a song break. And as we do in the Veterans Corner, we always ask our guests to – Pick the songs, and the first song you picked, Fran, was Walk on Water by Eddie Money. And uh, each song has a different meaning to every guest. What was the meaning of that song to you? Uh, to me, you know, this I think this song's about kind of about a little bit of perseverance where, you know, you just got to be dedicated to whatever your, your cause is, and it's just a, a, a really awesome 80s song. Well, if I could walk on water And if I could find some way if I could walk on water, would you believe in me? My love is so true. Well, I'm no angel 
And that was Eddie Money and Walk on Water. And this is Don Busney in the Veterans Corner. And we're brought to you courtesy of the Barnes FM New Brunswick. And our guests today are Fran Rachopi, who is a former U.S. Green Beret, who had a very distinguished career, and Jen Wilson. She is the CEO of the Invictus Corps and also of Army Week. And Fran was just taking us through his uh, Army experience. So you got out of Ranger School, and uh, you must have been very proud of yourself. That must have been a great day. But then you went on to U.S. Army Airborne School parachute training. Fran, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I was uh, you know, I was one of the fortunate, I'll say fortunate, but you kind of have two choices when you, uh, when you go. You can either get chosen to go to airborne school before ranger school, or you can go to airborne school after ranger school. And I like to say I was one of the lucky ones that went after, uh, only because you don't get the two or three jumps that you do in ranger school, but you, don't, you also don't get an opportunity to be injured. Uh, and ranger school is presenting enough opportunities to hurt you. Mm. And uh, taking one away by not having to jump out of airplanes was definitely a plus. Um, so I went to uh, airborne school after ranger school and spent, uh, you know, the three weeks down at, at Fort Benning, Georgia. And, uh, you know, just a great opportunity to, to learn one of the core skills of uh, every, you know, parachutist, uh, you know, infantryman, ranger, uh, or special forces operator uh, that we have in the Army. Great. Now, you know, a soldier must complete five jumps, including at least one night jump, to graduate from airborne school. Now, the sensation of jumping at night has got to be totally disorienting, totally different from jumping at day. Can you describe that for us? Well, you can't see anything. Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's probably the biggest difference. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you, I think you only, I think you only do one, one night jump in, uh, in airborne school. Uh, and I and I remember, you know, kind of coming out of the, the back of the airplane there, and uh, you, you can't see the ground. Um, and I remember another jump I had later on in the Special Forces Qualification Course where, you know, you jumped out and everything's black, but you can kind of see the slight uh, you know, differences in the grade um, of the ground below you. So really the difference between you know, open drop zone or potentially trees, you know, there at uh, the drop zone, at airborne school is massive. I mean, absolutely massive, and it's pretty hard not to hit the drop zone. So you're fairly confident that you're going to get on it, mm-hmm. and you don't really know when the ground's coming, so you're kind of just looking up in those last couple of seconds and then eventually hit the ground like a sack of potatoes and move on. But I remember, you know, a night jump I had there in the Special Forces qualification course when uh, I knew the only thing I knew was that I was over the tree. Wow. And because uh, it was much darker than the open drop zone was, you know, with the reflection of the moon. And I remember kind of hitting the ground there and uh, getting caught up in the trees and then getting hung up and uh, sliding down one of the trunks, you know, all the way to the ground, which, uh, you know, probably only lasted about three seconds, but it felt about a minute as I kind of rode that tree all the way down to the ground and that had a orient myself and figure out where I was. Imagine oh. Fran is about 6'4", 200 pounds. So oh, wow. Him hitting a tree with a parachute must have been fun to watch. It's probably a bad day for the tree. <laughs> well, no doubt. I'll tell you, it was a bad day for the chute because I had to I had to remove half the tree from the chute, and I'll, I'll probably uh, imagine that that chute was never never used again. I can imagine. So what altitude did you jump from? Uh, you jump at, at from 1,200 feet. That's pretty low. In airborne school. Uh, it is, and then uh, it's, it's about a minute. I think it's about a minute in the air, and then uh, with the static line jump, um, and then in uh, in Colorado, you know, when I was uh, stationed out there in both the infantry and special forces, we jumped a little higher, uh, 1,500 feet because of the uh, the altitude. Now, how much control do you have, friend, when where are you going to land? When you jump out of an aircraft uh, and parachute, I mean, how much control do you have? And you know, you see sometimes in the football games where. You know, the Army Knights land right in the middle of the football field, which is incredible. How do they do that? Well, I think, so there's two different kinds of jumping. There's the, the kind that the, that the uh, Army Knights will do when they, they land in the stadium, and that's with the square uh, free fall parachute. And we have, you know, teams, um, you know, especially in Special Forces that are free fall teams that specialize in that. And then there's the, the regular mass uh, exit World War II style, you know, get everybody out of the plane and onto the drop zone and into the fight as quickly as possible uh, you know, that, that the infantry does. And uh, those are around parachutes, and uh, you know, further you know, newer generations have squared them up a little bit. And you have the, some ability to control 
um, the direction that you're going, but nothing like that square parachute where you can land that you know, very precise with a stand-up landing. Mm-hmm. With the uh, with the parachutes that you know the mass exit is going to use. No matter what you try to do, the, the wind has supremacy over you, and uh, you're going to hit like a stack of bricks. Yeah, how fast are you going when you hit the ground? That depends on the wind. Mm. Um, I think in uh, in Colorado, way too fast all the time. Oh, it's windy out there, that's for sure. Oh, it is, all the time. So what was that feeling like when they when they pinned your wings on? That must have been a great day, too. It was. Um, and they actually, uh, you know, at the, gra- at the graduation for airborne school, they do a free fall jump. And uh, a jumper with a square parachute, you know, landed there right, you know, in the center of the graduation field. And I remember thinking to myself, that was not how that felt for me for the last three weeks when I was jumping out of planes. But that was a, that was a great moment. You know, another kind of notch on the bell, another core certification as, as an infantry officer uh, was complete. And, you know, after that, it was ready to, to move on and another day closer to getting out to being a platoon leader. You know, Fran, you mentioned free fall, and that's where you don't open your parachute until you're very low to the ground. Describe that for us. Uh, well, I would have to describe it through the lens of others, because uh, my specialty in, uh, in Special Forces was uh, mountaineering. So I was on a mountaineering detachment. But I know that uh, from the guys who were on the free fall team, they say there's nothing like it. Uh, you know, depending on the altitude that they jump at, and maybe 25,000 feet, uh, I, I think is the norm, um, that they get uh, you know, a, a, a good amount of free fall in there before they actually have to pull the chute. And it's really a, a core skill for some of our top tier operators, because when it, you start talking about trying to get small teams of people into very precise locations, undetected, being able to have that capability at night with a very quiet insertion uh, is really critical to what we try to do around the world. Even when you're six foot four, uh, there's guys bigger than me, Don. Really? Wow. Yep. They just they just fall faster. All right. Well, then you went on to Reconnaissance and Surveillance Leaders course, which is a 29-day school to train to expert levels in reconnaissance, surveillance, target acquisition, battle damage assessment, communications, planning, foreign vehicle identification, and other skills. Tell us more about that, Fran. I think that this school was probably the coolest one that I went to in in all my time um, because it really taught how to sneak around. And I, I say that, and you know, it's sort of joking, but, you know, whether it was uh, as a training environment was in the woods or whether it was more in an urban environment, it taught you the importance of being able to conduct reconnaissance and surveillance and being able to get close up to whatever your target was that you were watching and then how to report on it. And, you know, as we, uh, you know, enter into these conflicts around the world where having to understand what our enemy is doing is critical to our ability to stop them from uh, from conducting terrorist acts or whatever it may be. Uh, un- having these skills uh, is essential, uh, especially when you're operating in these small teams. Now back to uh, Jen for a minute. Jen, how did you meet Fran? So Fran um, was introduced to us at Army Week um, this past year at our, well, we, we rang the closing bell at the New York Stock Exchange on the day of our gala, and he was a guest of uh, a mutual friend of ours, and then that same friend brought him to our gala. Friend had just gotten out of the military and just moved to New York a couple of months before, um, and so he was new to the area, new to the veterans community in New York City. And I've, I've never asked him this, but I have to imagine it was um, going to that gala, the first one as a as a veteran, as opposed to being in the military, active duty, uh, was probably, um, certainly in the New York City area, probably a, a daunting experience. But we, we were uh, introduced and... and um, our friend Mark uh, asked me to to meet with him and uh, sort of uh, introduce him to our community. And I met up with him and I heard his his story. And then later, in a in a small intimate gathering, I heard his uh, his speech that he'll be doing uh, for Army Week in a couple of weeks. Um, and I sat there completely slack jawed for 45 minutes. And you know, I've I've been in media and television, and I've been to a ton of 
um, speakers' events, but there was absolutely nothing that that he said in that speech that I could even pretend to offer any feedback on, except that it was fantastic. And so after I heard that, uh, I knew that not only does, does the New York City veterans community need visible men like him uh, and women, obviously, but to show what it's like to be successful and to be not just in the military, but in their transition and to see that Yes, you're going to struggle, but you can succeed, and, and you can do all sorts of different things. You know, I mean, he can be at Merrill Lynch, he's getting his, his MBA, and he can also have this new potential career on the speaking circuit. And I think it's really critical for the veterans in our community to see men like Fran with unimpeachable integrity stand up and, and show them that you can you can do this through the transition. As difficult as it is, you can do this. They're not... I really, really, really hate the victimhood um, perception that is put on so many veterans of the Iraq War um, generation. Oh, I agree. Um, and men like men and women like Fran, so many of the the people he served with, don't get the megaphone like they should. And so, if Chris and I have the ability to give men like him the megaphone, then that's what we're going to do. That's great. Well, let's go to another song break now. And, uh, Fran, the next song you picked was The General. Tell us about it. Why would you pick that song? I think that, well, first, uh, you know, I grew up in Boston. Uh, I'm from Boston, and I remember, you know, Dispatch when they first became a band and going to uh, some small venues, uh, one called The, the Middle East, um, over in Cambridge, you know, and, and paying $3 to go and watch these guys who I've been able to watch their career explode since. But uh, the general is a great uh, song about a leader uh, identifying and taking care of the soldiers under his command. Well, here we go. Here is the general by dispatch. a decorated general with a heart of gold that likened him to all the stories he told of past battles won and lost and legends of old a seasoned veteran in his own time on the battlefield he gained respectful fame with many medals of bravery and stripes to his name he grew a beard as soon as he could to cover the scars on his face and always urged his men on but on the eve of a great battle with the infantry and dream the old general tossed in his sleep and lesser with its meaning he awoke from the night to tell what he had seen and walked slowly out of his tent All the men held tall with their chests in the air With the courage in their blood and a fire in their stare And it was a great morning and they all wondered how they would fare Till the old general told them to go home He said I have seen the others And I have discovered That this fight is not worth fighting And I've seen their mothers And I well know Follow me where I'm going So Take a shower and shine your shoes You got no time to lose If you are young men you must be living Take a shower and shine your shoes You got no time to lose If you are young men you must be living Go now you are forgiven But the men stood fast with their guns on their shoulders Not knowing what to do with the contradicting orders The general said he would do his own duty But he extended no further The men could go as they pleased But not a man moved Their eyes gazed straight ahead Till one by one they stepped back And not a word was said And the old general was left with his own words Echoing in his head He then prepared to fight He said I have seen the others And I have discovered That this fight is not worth fighting no, and I've seen their mothers, and I will no other to follow me where I'm going. So, take a shower and shine your shoes. Oh, you got no time to lose. You are young men, you must be living. Yeah, take a shower and shine your shoes. 
But you got no time to lose You are young man, you must be living Go now, you are forgiven That was a general by dispatch, and now we're going to play some uh, public service announcements, so please stay with us. We'll be right back. NASCAR crew members and our military service members have a lot in common. Both work in intense, stressful environments, changing tires under pressure and leading teams, one under fire on the battlefield and the other on pit road. Hope for the Warriors supports our veterans as they embark on their next mission by taking veterans and their families to the racetrack to show them how their skills learned in the military can translate to careers in the civilian sector. Support our military families. Visit hopeforthewarriors.org to stand for hope today. My grandfather served in World War II. Spending time with him were the best memories of my life. I became a physician at VA because of my grandfather, so I can help others like him. I can't imagine working with better doctors or a more dedicated staff. I'm fulfilling my life's mission with the help of my team and thanks to these veterans. I'm proud to be a doctor at VA and proud to honor my grandfather every day. Search VA Careers to find out more. And we're back in the Veterans Corner. This is Don Busney. We're brought to you courtesy of DeMarish UFM, New Brunswick. And our guests today are former U.S. Army Green Beret, Mr. Fran Rachopi. And Jen Wilson, who is the CEO of the Invictus Corps and Army Week. So that's an interesting song, Dispatch. It's, uh, you kind of got to think about that one, don't you, Jen? Yeah, I had, uh, I had actually never heard that song before, to, to be completely honest. Yeah, it's, I hadn't heard it either, but a couple of the guests have uh, requested it. It particularly seems to be popular with the Army. Fran, why is that? I think one of the biggest reasons is because that is a song where the, the general is thinking very critically about the situation in front of him. And he, most importantly, is taking accountability and responsibility, and he's not asking anyone to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. Mm-hmm. And as a leader, uh, especially a leader in the military or you know, any, even in the corporate world, you know, anything where you're in charge of other people and the decisions that you make uh, you know, affect uh, you know, negatively or positively, the people around you and the organization that you serve, uh, you cannot ask people to do things that you are not willing to do yourself. Oh, that is very true. So, Fran, you actually deployed to Iraq three times. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And the first time you deployed there in 2005 as a platoon leader as part of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and you spent 12 months. Now, whereabouts in Iraq were you? Um, I was in the city of Balad. Balad. So about uh, 35 40 miles north of Baghdad. Can you tell us in an overview what your mission there was? Yeah, our, our mission there, um, much like many of the other infantry units, was to secure the, the local area, primarily the city of Balad, um, and to you know, seek out and uh, arrest uh, any of the insurgent uh, elements that may have been present in the area. Um, that area at the time was uh, had been a, a Ba'ath Party uh, head, headquarters under Saddam Hussein. Um, there were a lot of people who still remain loyal to the previous regime, and it was a, a hotbed for um, some of the sectarian violence that occurred in the, the 2005 to 2007, 2008 time frame. So when you came back from Iraq, that wasn't punishment enough. You wanted to punish yourself some more. So you went to the Special Forces Qualification Course, also known as the Q Course, and that can last anywhere between 56 and 95 weeks. Tell us more about that, Fran. Well, luckily I was on the shorter end of that, uh, more <laughs> closer to the 56 versus the 95. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, when I, when I came back, I was, I was really proud of how my platoon and how my unit had conducted themselves in Iraq. And as I looked forward into you know, the next stage of my career, I kind of said, well, you know, what do I want to be in? And I thought back to those reasons why I went into the Army. You know, when, I, when I saw the, the bearded guys on horseback riding around Afghanistan, I said, you know what, now's the time. Um, my window is open to go into uh, Special Forces, and I sent my application in to go to this selection for Special Forces Qualification Course, and uh, went to that and was selected and then went on uh, to the school. 
so, you know, it was about kind of achieving that goal that I had when I set out to come into the Army and then take the next step in my career. Now you deployed to Iraq two more times, serving as Mountaineering Special Forces Detachment Commander from 2009 to 2012. Now, the Mountaineering part is the part that really interests me. I thought that was the 10th Mountain Division. I thought they did that. So, historically, you know, back in, in the, the World War II days, you know, the, the 10th Mountain Division had been had done a lot, a lot of mountain, mountaineering operations, and they were even at one point located at Fort Carson, Colorado, or Colorado Springs. When we look at uh, you know the construct of special forces units uh, across the army, we have teams that specialize in different things, and one of those things that they specialize is mountaineering. And I and I was fortunate enough to uh, be on one of these teams and command one of these teams for three years. And I will tell you, there were a lot of days where I looked around and I said, this is my job. This is amazing. And you couldn't replace it with anything else because I was training, um, whether it be internally training our own team or our own company, our own battalion on cold weather operations and skiing uh, and avalanche certification, uh, or whether it was taking some of our foreign partner forces from different countries around the world and teaching them skills up in the Rocky Mountains, you know, outside of uh, you know, Colorado Springs. Uh, it was an amazing opportunity uh, to learn some really critical skills that helps us to operate in the environment. So in 2013, then, you deployed to Djibouti, which is at the boot of Africa in sport of Operation Enduring Freedom. And in that assignment, you coordinated special operations to combat al-Shabaab throughout East Africa. And al-Shabaab, as we know from the news, is an offshoot of the Islamic Court Union, which splintered into several factions after its defeat in 2006 by Somalia's transitional federal government. Al-Shabaab's troop strength was at one time estimated to be between seven to 9,000 militants. And now, as of 2017 or 16, the group seems to have retreated from major cities, but it still controls a few rural areas. Fran, what can you tell us about that? Well, one of the, the critical things that special forces and special operations uh, does, you know, outside of some of the, uh, a declared war zone like Iraq and Afghanistan, is enable and prepare our foreign counterparts to uh, combat terrorist threats. And when you look at you know, Africa as a whole, or you know, especially East Africa, uh, building up the capabilities of the nation um, individually is of critical importance. And as we you know, look to combat al-Shabaab there in East Africa, you know, who were kind of centered in, in Somalia and had been responsible for kidnappings and attacks within Kenya and, and Uganda and Tanzania, and then also for some of the piracy that was occurring off the coast, off the Horn of Africa, that was a major international effort uh, led by an organization called AMISOM, or the African you know, African Mission. And our job was to go out and find and train and equip uh, some of these foreign nations and some of their their units there to be able to uh, conduct counterterrorism operations against al-Shabaab, not only in Somalia, but also in the region. Now, in 2014, you uh, planned and coordinated the Special Forces response to Boko Haram, in West Africa. Tell us about that. Well, I was fortunate enough uh, during that, that time period, you know, spring of 2014, shortly after Boko Haram had kidnapped the 200-plus schoolgirls, uh, to be stationed in Germany and part uh, of the headquarters element that was coordinating the special forces operations in Western Africa. And one of the things that we were responsible for was to... Uh, find a solution uh, working with our West African partners, uh, you know, whether and that was not only Nigeria, but Chad and Cameroon and Niger in combating Boko Haram. And so it was a very multinational effort. Um, it gave me the opportunity to travel the region extensively and work with some of our, our foreign um, militaries and come together uh, as partners, along with some of our you know, Western allies, to build a force um, in, within each of these countries that could then combat and contain Boko Haram uh, with the goal 
of preventing them from spreading throughout the region and then also bringing these girls back. Now, where does that stand? How successful has it been to rescue those girls? You know, building a coalition um, is always a challenging effort, especially oh, it when it's in, it's in the light of um, the, the news, um, especially the international news, as this event was. And I think it took some time to get those efforts aligned across very different countries with very different mindsets uh, and very different cultures. And as things started to solidify in the months after the the kidnapping and over the course of the ensuing year, year and a half, and everybody came together, it's been effective so far. Um, There was a lot of time that it took, you know, where we lost trying to get a coalition in place. Mm -hmm. And I believe, you know, as we stand now, uh, many of the girls have been have been returned. Many have escaped and found their way back to their homes. Boko Haram, you know, as entity, has been contained for the most part. You don't hear about a lot of the the massive attacks in some of the villages that we did see a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. But it's going to take uh, it's going to take a, a, a concerted effort uh, for the long run to see this through. You know, as we see with any counterterrorism operation, um, you have to stick with it to see an end uh, to the organization. It is very time-consuming, and it's always a long-term strategy to do that. Well, let's take another song break now, and this next one kind of speaks for itself. I think it probably is the mantra of uh, the Special Forces. It's called Living on a Prayer. So here we go. Living on a Prayer by Bon Jovi. And that was Bon Jovi and Living on a Prayer. And this is Don Busney in the Veterans Corner. 
And our guests today are former U.S. Army Green Beret Fran Rachopi and Jen Wilson, who is the CEO of the Invictus Corps and Army Week. And getting back to Living on a Prayer, Jen Wilson, what do you think about that song? Well, you said it was the the mantra of uh, the Green Berets. I really think it's the mantra of um, karaoke late nights for the Green Berets. I think you're right. You sound like you <laughs> you sound like you've had some experience there, Jen Wilson. Five or four. I've oh, had a couple. I guess. I guess. All right. <laughs> well, we won't go into that unless you want to. No, we'll leave we'll leave that for uh, for the private conversation. Leave that for the private conversation. All right, so in July 2014, and Fran Rachopi served as an advisor and aide to the commander of Special Operations Command Africa, General James Linder, who was a two-star general officer. I just want to say that to be a, an advisor and an aide to someone of the stature of General James Linder, that in itself is quite a distinction, Fran, so congratulations on that. You want to tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was it was an honor and uh, a pleasure to serve uh, General Linder. He's by far um, one one of the finest officers that uh, this nation has ever seen, and you know he'll continue to move forward in his career. And the Army and this nation will be forever grateful to uh, this man. And most people will never know uh, the impact that he has had. Um, but it was an amazing experience. I was able to travel all over Africa uh, with him, sit in at some of the most senior you know, policy and strategic discussions with not only you know, our partners uh, in the different African countries, but also you know, with the U.S. State Department and different interagency folks who are out there um, contributing to the U.S. mission. But, uh, you know, I was, it was really a, a fortunate um, opportunity for me where you know, I had worked in and around uh, Special Operations Command Africa for a couple of years while I had been there in Germany and then also in Djibouti. And I think we had a series of meetings uh, that revolved around the Boko Haram situation. And I think I opened my mouth one too many times uh, in a couple of meetings. And my boss came to me and said, hey, guess what? Uh, you're going to go interview to be the next aide. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, yep, uh, you had the answers to the questions that no one else had, and uh, guess what you're going to do? You're going to answer the man. <laughs> so that is that is quite a distinction. But, you know, Major General Linder, after you uh, served under him, uh, he went on to take command of the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which just shows you the stature and distinction of General Linder. You want to comment on that, Fran? Absolutely. I mean, uh, his, his, the trust that has been put in him to, to move on and take command of the, what we call the proponency and you know, all of the doctrine and all of the training for all of the U.S. Army um, special operations is, is tremendous. Um, and there's no, no better man for the job. He's been there uh, going on about 18 months, almost two years now, and has been doing an amazing job there. And I'm sure that the trust will continue to be put in him and he'll continue to move on to positions of increased uh, responsibility and impact, uh, both not only for our nation, but also for the military. I'm sure he was very glad to have you working for him. Let's get back to uh, your military decorations. You have a whole host of them, and we won't go into all of them. But your decorations include three Bronze Star medals, one for valor, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Joint Service Commendation Medal, three Army Commendation Medals, oh, one with valor. I'm sure, you're a very humble guy, Fran, but do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, the, the three you know, Bronze Star Medals were for my, my time in Iraq. Um, I, I was able to earn the Defense Meritorious Service Medal for my time with uh, General Linder and my uh, contributions to the mission in Africa. I was able to uh, get the Joint Service Commendation Medal for my position in Djibouti versus uh, Al-Shabaab, and then uh, the three Army Commendation Medals you know, for various things in my career, and the one uh, Valor Medal, which was a, an Army Commendation Medal, uh, was for an uh, uh, instance in Iraq when I was an infantry platoon leader uh, in which we were on a company operation, which uh, you know, every, all units were engaged with the enemy at various points. And I guess, you know, often you make, uh, you get awards for valor when all of your rational thought uh, is dismissed and you, I guess, just 
you know, operate by instinct, and, uh, you know, it's not something you think about. I'm very gracious to my leadership for you know, putting the trust in, and you know, valuing my contributions. But, you know, again, at the time, it was about uh, you know, getting our, our brothers out of harm's way and doing everything we can to combat the enemy. Well, Fran, thank you for your valor and your service. Now, today you live in New York City, and uh, you work in wealth management and financial services at Merrill Lynch. I'm not even going to begin to ask you what that transition must have been like, but share some thoughts with us. Well, it's been a great transition. It's a great organization. Wealth management and the financial services are really at the core of you know, everything that's done in you know the world, especially in the corporate sector and the business environment. Uh, so combining that experience there with getting my MBA from NYU Stern has been a really important stepping stone to the next chapter of my life. And when you, you look forward and think about, well, where do I want to be in the future? And you think about, well, how do I get to where I am now? And one of the most important things that the Army does is it teaches you that you have to have an academic base for everything that you do. And at every promotion and at every new job you have in the military, you go to school. Uh, and you get that academic base, and then after the graduation, you move forward, and then you start to apply that uh, in, on a practical matter you know, in the real world. So as I've kind of stepped into this new chapter, getting the MBA was the first step, combining that with you know, working in an industry in which I'm passionate about and want to make a difference in and contribute to uh, has really been the key to uh, moving forward. That's great. Well, before we uh, close out the program, I just want to ask Jen Wilson about uh, – she's hosting a program at HBO on January 26th of which Fran Rachopi will be the guest speaker. Jen, tell us about that. That sounds like an exciting event. Yeah, so HBO has been one of our uh, partners um, since the very inception of Army Week. Um, we uh, had – their former CEO, the CEO emeritus for 30 years, Bill Nelson, as our first soldier for life. Um, and their current CEO, um, Richard Plepler, has been a supporter of ours since the very beginning. And so once a year, they'll give us their theater um, at their headquarters on 42nd Street um, to screen one of their documentaries. And then we usually stage a panel or a speaker. And like I was saying earlier, um, I had heard I had heard Fran's um, speech a few months ago, and uh, I knew that uh, I wanted to use our megaphone to help further his speaking uh, engagements and to get the words that he has out to the masses. And so on the uh, 26th of January, we're screening the HBO documentary, Only the Dead See the End of War, which was shot over about eight years by the, the filmmaker. And he was playing both sides of the fence in Iraq. He was dealing with al-Zarqawi and dealing with the Americans. Um, and so you get to see both sides. And it's all handheld, so it's it's incredibly uh, compelling uh, documentary. And then uh, Fran will be speaking for about 45 minutes. And he doesn't even know this yet, but um, as of about 10 o'clock this morning, it was uh, sold out and waitlisted. Wow, that's great. That's great. So we're at the top of the hour, and we ask our guests to uh, give a shout-out to family, friends, and loved ones. So starting with Fran Rachopi, you're on. Yeah, I just want to. Say, give a shout out and say hi to my seven year old daughter, Lily. Jen, how about you? Mine obviously will go out to Chris because he will be home and at the end of the month. Obviously, he's not listening, but we'll send him the uh, the footage later. But Christopher Page, I can't wait to see you, pal. Oh yeah, me too. I mean, I really had a nice association with Chris. I was working in New York when uh, so was he, and uh, yeah, a finer gentleman you couldn't find. And uh, we're going to welcome him back with open arms, and thank God he made it uh, safe and sound. Amen to that. Well, again, I want to thank Fran Rachopi, former U.S. Green Beret, and Jen Wilson, the CEO of the Invictus Corps and Army Week, and thank you for being on the Veterans Corner. It has been a real pleasure. Thanks for having and us, Don. Now to all the yeah, thank you, Don. men and women who wear the uniform of the Armed Forces of the United States, and all you veterans out there who have worn the uniform so proudly, with a special shout-out to the over 2,000 student veterans here at Rutgers University, this is for you. Army.
Navy. Coast Guard. Air Force. Marine Corps. And once again, on behalf of Don Busney in the Veterans Corner, we say thank you to Fran Rachopi and Jen Wilson. For any comments on today's program or the Veterans Corner, please email us at vetscornernj at gmail.com. That is vetscornernj at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and have a great week.